we want you to automate handwritten notes. It's not enough to send them. We want you to automate them because even if you make the intention to send handwritten notes, a lot of people aren't as good as you, Tim. They just stop doing it month one, month two. But if you automate it and you turn your service into utility, where they don't even think about it, it's A, keeps them doing what they want to do, what they intend to do, and B, it makes us money. So it was always the intention that handwritten would not be a marketing platform. It would be a customer experience utility. Hey, welcome to the Tension Podcast. My name is Tim Sweetman. I'm your host. It's my job to interview leaders and thinkers about their unique ways of thinking about business and life and how they've learned to lean into the moments of tension in their own lives. My guest today is David Wax. David is a serial entrepreneur and his latest venture, Handwritten, which we talked about in detail here, is bringing back the lost art of letter writing through scalable, robot-based solutions that write your notes in pen. Developed as a platform, Handwritten lets you send notes from your CRM system, such as Salesforce, uh, the website, apps, or through custom integration. I use it. It's absolutely tremendous. Uh, it's used by major mailboxes, e-commerce giants, nonprofits, professionals. It is changing the way brands and people connect. Prior to his current initiative, David founded Sellit, which was a mobile marketing platform and mobile agency. Under David's leadership, Sellit became a leading player in the mobile marketing space and invented the concept of mobile customer relationship management. Sellit developed one of the most robust and widely used mobile marketing platforms in the world, delivering millions of SMS and MMS messages to consumers on a daily basis. With a marquee client roster, including Abercrombie & Fitch, Toys R Us, Sam's Club, Chicago Tribune, for Rent Media Solutions, Pizza Hut, and more, Sellit was recognized as one of the top 500 fastest growing companies in America as number 262 on the Inc. 500 in 2010, delivered many award-winning mobile campaigns, and built one of the best teams in the mobile industry. It was sold to Hello World in January of 2012. David is also a frequent speaker on messaging technology and is presented for the Direct Marketing Association, South by Southwest, Advertising Research Foundation, and the National Restaurant Association. He's been featured in the Washington Post and has been interviewed by Direct Marketing News, uh, Crane Chicago Business, and the American Express Open Network, uh, Bloomberg Radio, and, uh, along with many others. He's been quoted in numerous articles and has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Variety, Startup Nation, etc. He writes for Inc. Magazine with his column, Stepping Away from the Day to Day. You are going to love this conversation with the innovator, creator, and amazing entrepreneur, David Wax. I want to hear a little bit more about how your meeting with Conan O'Brien has impacted your philosophy on life and leadership. Man, do you have, and so I was reading your notes before this interview and I was just thinking, I don't know if you have a, an investigative reporter or somebody that goes out and digs up stuff, but <laughs> that was actually uh, dealing with Conan O'Brien or meeting Conan O'Brien was probably the most impactful words of advice I've ever heard. I went to school in Pennsylvania and I was part of a group called Connaissance at school. And Connaissance was the group that would bring speakers to campus. So we brought Dick Vitale, Dr. Ruth Westheimer, a bunch of speakers. And I usually had the opportunity to either meet them in a private reception after because, you know, I was on the planning committee or take them to dinner. And in the case of Danny Glover and Conan O'Brien, we went to dinner and I was you know, the team was kind of shy. I wasn't as shy. So I started talking to Danny Glover, uh, to both of them. Danny Glover is a heck of a guy. Side note, he spent the first half of his career as a social worker in San Francisco. He didn't get into acting into his late forties, I believe. So you can change your life entirely for any of your listeners. But then we met with Conan O'Brien and over dinner, he said, you know, um, and this was right as Conan O'Brien was starting out on The Late Show or his show on NBC, I believe. You know, at that time, he was very thoughtful. I'm sure he still is about what he wanted to say because he was new to this whole game. We were the first university ever spoke to. And he said to us, if I had to give you any advice at all, it would be always get in over your head. Mm. And here I am 
25 years later, and it still resonates with me. So often, I think people stay in their comfort zone. You know, Danny Glover could have stayed um, as a social worker his entire life and been in that comfort zone. But by getting in over his head and really reaching, he, like me, like you, like everybody else, you could do things you never thought you could do. Necessity is the mother of invention, and you either sink or swim. And thrown in the deep end, you force yourself to swim. And that's what I think about a lot as an entrepreneur is getting in over your head. You know, we can talk later about handwritten if you want. But, you know, one of the big points of differentiation of handwritten is we've designed our own technology. We have all these robots around here. I don't know how to make a robot. I never thought I'd be building robots. But here I am now with 175 robots and we're leasing them out. And now we're building machine vision systems and invisible marking things so that we can stuff these notes. All of this stuff is way over my head and, and way over my engineer's head, but you kind of figure it out. And I really look for people when I hire that kind of have the figure it out gene because there's those, like my old head of operations, she was with us for years and years and years. On paper, she would not be the person you'd want to hire. And at first glance, she wouldn't be the person you'd want to hire. She kind of seemed like a dissy lady. But once I kind of tested her on a few things, she definitely had the figure it out gene and she was a terrific hire for years and years and years. And then she left to go pursue other things. But the figuring it out and getting in over your head is, is really, I think a lot of people have what I call analysis paralysis. They just think about something and build financial models or what if this, what if that, but they never act. And you have got to act and you've got to try doing what you want to do because every day you just get a little older and as you know, with kids, things get harder. Uh, you have more responsibility and more financial responsibility, everything else. And so the best day to start a business, pretty much always today, you know, mm. to just jump in that type of thing. Was, I don't know if that answered it, but- It uh, does. I, it does. Was that gene in you or that desire, did that start early? I mean, you, you could maybe talk a little bit about Macrologic Solutions seemed like you jumped yeah. into entrepreneurship sort of early on. Was that innate within you or did you develop this idea and this gene over time? You know, when I was a little, little kid, and I don't know if you uncovered this too. Um, so I, I, at Handwritten, we we write out handwritten cards. And, and if you choose one of our pre-designed ones, the back of it says Red Wagon. It doesn't say handwritten. Because we don't want anybody to know you used our service. The big issue with our platform, we don't get any viral marketing. But anyway... We say the cards are red wagon. The reason they're red wagon is because when I was five years old, and it was a different era back then, I would take my brother's red wagon. It was called the Jeffrey wagon, G-E-O, whatever. And I would load it up with candy from Price Club, which was the old Costco, and I'd go door to door selling it. And if I didn't have any candy that day, I'd go and grab the first aid kit, and I was five. I would put it in the, the red wagon and go door to door asking if anybody had any emergencies going on. And people would often say no. And I'd say, okay, I'll try back later. I think I always had the desire to start a business. Macrologic solutions, quite frankly, between us, it was a ploy to get into college. Early in high school, I, I want to say freshman or sophomore year, I was selling poinsettias to raise money for band, for my high school band. I was a band dork and I walked into a computer store called Computers by CBA. Back then, it wasn't all Best Buy and Dell and Apple. It was like there were smaller computer builders. You'd build computers and sell them called a bar, value-added reseller. But I walked into one of these computer stores and I sold them a poinsettia or two and I also ended up with a job. And I then go to Computers by CBA after school and build computers and program them and all the rest for this very, very small company. And then after a few years, I think junior year of high school, I decided, you know, I could do this on my own. At that point, I knew all the distributors for parts and I knew how to build them. And uh, my friend Dwight and I started Macrologic Solutions really as a, something to just throw on the resume and say we had a running computer company. But the problem was it became too successful and not financially. It was financially fine. But the problem was I was leaving for college and I had a bunch of clients now that counted on us 
These were often upper middle income housewives that needed to learn how to use their Windows 3.1 computer. So I didn't want to leave our clients high and dry when I went off to college because I lived in Arizona, college was in Pennsylvania, it wouldn't work. So we closed up shop early for that reason. But there's some good stories from MacroLogic. I used to, you know, it was just me and my friend Dwight. It was really just me, but we would order parts from our local distributor. I'd get on the phone and, you know, I was 16 or 17 and I'd say, hello, this is, you know, I'd do my best low voice. This is Mr. Wax calling from MacroLogic. And then I'd order the parts and they'd say, okay, they'll be ready, you know, in a few hours. And say, okay, I'll send my delivery boy down to get them. And then I'd get in the car and drive down and pick them up. And this went on for months and months and months. And then finally, the guy figured it out. And it was really funny because he was, the distributor would be putting fake testimonials on his wall and he'd share them with me because I was just the lowly delivery boy. But later he found out, you know, I was buying all these computer parts from him and he, and he was like, oh my God, what did I tell you? You know, that type of But so there was that. And then we had some bigger distributors like Miracell and Ingram Micro. These were back in the day, very big computer resellers and I'd need to fax them orders. Well, I'd be in high school. So I'd go into the library and for whatever reason, the high school library had a fax machine back then, fax machines were a thing. I'd fax them orders, but then the library started getting faxes back. And they didn't know what to do with these. So I got in close with the librarian because they were helping me run my business. So it was an interesting time for sure. That sounds like the figure it out gene in. Yeah, it was it, fun. Yeah, it's amazing. Okay, so you went from there, went to school. What I found interesting in learning about your story was the emergence of your eventually a very successful company selling. Yeah. And I didn't realize that it had been birthed out of you getting fired unexpectedly. I kind of want to just take a moment. Maybe you can, you can talk a little bit about, this is such an interesting thing to me. How do you go from getting fired and then getting your mentality to a place where you're starting your own company? That's really fascinating to me. Well, it was a point of desperation. It was the best thing to ever happen to me. So I did a five-year degree at an Ivy League school. I walked out and my parents only paid for half of it. So I walked out of college with a boatload of debt and I had a great education, but I was saddled with debt. So my first three jobs out of college, my first one was a consultant. The second one, I, I actually interviewed at the company that ended up firing me and I turned them down because they were nuts. And then I went to an investment bank and then I hated that too. So I went I eventually ended up at the venture capital firm that kept asking me to join. So I had all this debt and I had paid it down over those four years. And then finally was just about to pay it off. But because of that, I had zero nest egg. You know, I wasn't making a ton of money. I was spending all of my money paying down my debt and I had zero nest egg. So I moved out to San Diego, took this job at this venture capital firm. I had realized it was a bad idea the time before I went out there. They offered me a position, I turned them down. A year later, I hated it, went back, or they contacted me and I went and I made the bad decision to take that job. And it was insane. You know, here I was, I thought I was hot stuff coming out of investment banking, consulting, and a good education pedigree. And he had me hauling truck tires for his G-Wagon all over the place or organizing his dozen broken portable DVD players. He just was a, a hoarder and just had all this stuff that no human should have. Like, I don't know if you remember back in high school, the sculpture or like the sculptures of the human body where the head was cut in half and you could take out half the brain, throw it around like a football. He had one of those. Why he had one of those, I have no idea. But he had me organizing his junk and reviewing deals, which I did. He had my office bugged, which is a whole nother story. I found out about that and shook my head in disbelief. And then one day he came into my office screaming at me about something I had nothing to do with. He said, I sold stock and anybody in San Diego knows this guy. Nothing gets past this guy without his personal approval. There was no way the lowest guy in the totem pole would get approval to sell. He came in my office, screamed to me, said, I sold a bunch of stock and fired him. But it was good because at the same time, also a story best told over beers, I was evicted from my apartment. 
for no sane reason. So anyway, they ended up eventually wanting me to come back to the company as long as I wrote a formal apology for the horrible thing I did. And I was just like, I wasn't born yesterday. This was insane. And I quit and I packed up all my stuff and I moved back to Phoenix pretty much penniless because again, I used all my money to pay down debt. So I moved back to Phoenix. I was trying to figure out what to do. I was already interviewing and not having any luck interviewing. And my father actually said, why don't you do something with Blackberries and barcodes provide information on houses. And this is back in 2004. You have to understand there was no iPhone. I, I don't know how old you are, but there was no iPhone back then. All you would do is you'd see an empty wire box hanging from the real estate sign and you'd want info on the house. There's no info available. And then you tried calling the realtor and you couldn't get them on the phone. So I said, well, I don't know about Blackberries and barcodes. He was a little prescient with QR codes, actually. But I said, why not use text messaging where you text home to a number, 30364, and then get info on this house. And we could send back pictures of the inside of the house and description and price, and then send the lead, your phone number, to the realtor. And so he said, yeah, that's a good idea. So he gave me a roof over my head in one of his apartments that he rented out. And I spent the next nine months developing house for sale. And very quickly, I realized I didn't want to just be doing this real estate thing. I thought there needed to be a bigger product and House for Sale was the first offering in there. So I created this company called Sell It, C-E-L-L-I-T. And I developed House for Sale. I was dating a girl in Chicago because before the San Diego firm, I met a girl back in Chicago. So I'd fly with whatever savings I had, I'd fly back to Chicago and then walk from the train to her house. And I'd see all these bars and I thought we could probably use the same texting technology to allow bars to reach out to their patrons. So I created the thing called Coupon Zap. In Coupon Zap, people text bar to 30364 to get drink alerts and that type of thing. So what happened was House for Sale never took off. Dealing with realtors is very, very difficult. But we used that technology for Auto Trader, for Rent Magazine, which is a big magazine. Marie Claire magazine to get info on products in the magazine, all these other use cases. And then coupon Zap became the mobile CRM system used by Abercrombie and Fitch and Toys R Us and Sam's Club and Office Max and Crate and Barrel and all these big brands. And we were sending millions of text messages a day for these big brands. And it didn't take that long. I started the company. I bootstrapped it with my father's investment in 2004. And then I sold the company in 2012. Mm. So when I sold the company, I early on started getting phone calls from this guy, Todd, at an investment bank. And when he started reaching out to me, it was literally me and one sales guy. And I said, you know, that's nice of you, but we're nowhere near sell size. And he said, well, but you will be. And then I kept in touch with him and a lot of things happened in the mobile industry. One, the iPhone came out. And there were things like push notifications that I thought would take over and make text code more limited. And then two, there was a lot of regulation on text. And everything we were doing was above board. Everybody had to opt in. We weren't sending spam text, but there was a lot of crackdown on it. And actually a Northwestern law student thought he'd make his payday by claiming we sent him an unsolicited message, which we didn't. We were able to track it down that he had opted in, but those unsolicited text messages could have cost hundreds of millions of dollars, like insane amounts of money, way more at the time. I don't know if you remember, Wells Fargo was going through that whole thing where they were signing up people to loans they didn't ask for. I don't know if you remember that back in 2012. And the fine for that, for signing a Wells Fargo customer for a loan was less than the fine of me sending you a single text message that you didn't want. So I thought the risk there was just simply too high. And I sold the company to a marketing firm based out of Detroit. Mm. And then I worked for that company for two years. That was a very hard two years. For the first year, it was great. I just had to keep doing what I was doing. The second year, I had to pass the keys over to a new manager and watch them run the company into the ground. And I had to sit there and, and watch that happen. It was very painful. But then 2014, Jan 1, 2014, I was out of contract and on my own and started handwritten pretty much directly there. It's incredible. So why 
did you decide to start handwritten? When I was doing the text platform, I saw a couple of things. I saw the number of text people were getting, and it did create tremendous value. We worked with the Tropical Smoothie Cafe, which is like Jamba Juice. And whenever they'd send out a text message, they'd have lines out their door, apparently. So I was thrilled that it worked, but I saw the number of texts and the number of emails. And then you get into Slack and Twitter and Facebook and all these other messaging platforms. I just thought people were getting inundated with electronic communication. At the same time, when I'd walk by people's offices at my office, they'd have any card, any birthday card or whatever on display. So not only would they open it and read it, they'd put it on display. So I thought there could be an opportunity here to automate that because I buy birthday cards for my mom and go you know, at Walgreens in Chicago. I then bring it home in my laptop bag, not have a stamp. And there the birthday card would sit in my laptop and it would never get sent because I was just simply too lazy to do anything about it. So I thought, gee, maybe if I develop a service for myself where I can make sending a handwritten note as easy as sending an email, that might be something. That's what we did, or I did, pretty much the next day after leaving Sell It, I started handwritten, which was a mistake. I should have traveled or something, but I started handwritten with two off-the-shelf auto pen machines, which is antiquated technology, but that's what we started with. And then I built our iPhone app first because I wanted to have this API-centric approach, which I can talk about. But I developed the iPhone app and we kind of scaled that. And I started realizing these auto pens wouldn't pass muster. They didn't look real. Every time I needed a new feature on them, I'd go back to the company and the company was a bunch of deadheads, you know, Grateful Dead followers. They could care less about their machine. I made the decision, we're going to have to figure it out and build a robot. And it took several years and several attempts. And now we have 175 of them. So now what we do is we're the largest player in sending handwritten notes at scale. Right now, because of Christmas, at the time of this recording, we're doing about 20,000 a day. And yeah, it's just interesting when you have an idea and then you don't realize the ramifications and the mess it creates. Like a couple of years ago, I'm like, you know, we should really offer gift cards. We should really offer the ability to include a Starbucks card or something. And that became a huge logistical issue years later, but I'm still glad we did it. But it's interesting, the unintended consequences and all that. I don't know if that answers it, but yeah, handwritten is 100% owned by me. It's self-funded, bootstrap, profitable, which is interesting because we just had a competitor in the real estate space raise $20 million and then go under like two years later. So I'm just like, what are they doing? How do you burn $20 million? $20 million, if you figure it out, what it would take to burn $20 million, it's not easy to do when you can start a bigger company profitably. And it's just the mentality of working with other people's money and having that horrible fiduciary responsibility of just burning it and not thinking about the consequences. It's just amazing to me. And neither of my companies really received any outside funding other than my father giving me a roof over my head in the first one. So yeah, I mean, it's an interesting mentality. And because we have grown profitably, we haven't had skyrocketing growth. It's been gradual, but it's fun to talk to people like you because I know you use our service. And that's why I do this. When I hear about people using our service, I, it just, it's really cool. Really cool. Are you looking for new ways to navigate the many tensions in your life? Do you want to learn how to embrace these tensions to create innovative solutions you never thought possible? Then you're going to want to check out the Tension Newsletter, dedicated to exploring all of the many, many tensions we encounter in life. Each week, we delve into topics like work-life balance, profit versus people, profit versus purpose, the political and social tensions that all impact us. Our contributors, including myself, will offer insights and practical advice on how to embrace these tensions and create solutions and innovations that can transform your life. So if you're ready to take your life to the next level and learn how to harness the power of tension to drive innovation and growth, I ask you to sign up for our newsletter today. You won't want to miss out on this incredible opportunity to explore the tensions that shape our lives and discover new ways to thrive as human beings directly to your inbox. 
All right, back to the show. I think what's so interesting, there's a number of thoughts I have here. And I remember the first time, and I believe it's your VC back competition that I saw first. They spent a lot of money on ads. There was a lot. How long ago? It was a lot. It was quite, it wasn't recently. I would say it was probably 2015, 2016, maybe in that, okay. that, that region. That, that was Bond. Yes. Um, Bond was, so it's weird. I got to say it's really weird. So when I thought of handwritten, I was still in lockup. When I sold my last company, you have typically what's called an earn out, which is the mm-hmm. two year period where I had a, the first year I had to grow the company as much as I could, which I did. Second year I had to hand over the keys to watch them destroy it. But I was locked up and I couldn't do anything over those two years. And I had the idea for handwritten. And then at the very end of the two-year period, Bond came out. I'm mm-hmm. like, well, that what is he? That the ether. There's something in the zeitgeist or the ether, and people have the same idea. And so Bond came out with a lot of flat. What they didn't have was a good technology platform. They were using a pen. Basically, they glued it to a 3D printer, which works. A 3D printer moves X and Y. And it moves up and down so you can move the pen up and down. What you can't do is push papers through it. And because of that, somebody had to sit there and put a new piece of paper on and four little magnets to hold the paper down. And it was like a Gutenberg press from the whatever, 1400s or whatever that happened. So it just, they didn't scale. They did sell to Newell Rubbermaid. And the funny thing was they sold to Rubbermaid because they were mentioned in the New York Times. There was like a huge story on them in the New York Times. Rubbermaid saw the story, got them, and then within six months, shut them down, which I was just like, why bother buying them? But what happened was right after that happened, the CFO of Rubbermaid became one of our clients. And I emailed him. I said, hey, thanks so much for being a client. You do know you just shut down a company that does exactly what we do. And he said, yeah, great product, horrible company, horrible business. One thing that Handwritten's done to the beginning is really think about paper feeding. Paper feeding, you can believe it or not, at scale. And now order management is much harder than writing the order. Writing the order, I mean, we're always improving that process and coming up with new ways to do it and improve it and make it look better and everything. But that's kind of the easy part. That's the software side. Getting paper through the robot and then once it's through the robot, tracking it, QAing it, stuffing it, that's the hard part. And that's what we spend all our effort on here. Wow. Um, so while they've taped a pen to a 3D printer or screwed a pen to a 3D printer, we were building from the ground up a whole robust paper feeding system. And now there's a few competitors that have, have things to some degree, but that was really why we're here and there now. Talk to me. I think this is the great example of the difference between a platform and a website. I love that framework. I think it's a applicable to so many other areas of business and entrepreneurship and life. Because that's when I think about Bond, I think about a killer website. It was flashy. It was interesting, but obviously it ultimately failed. And they they shot up like a rocket and it kind of exploded. Whereas you've been intentional to build and create a platform. Talk about that framework and that mentality, why you've chosen to go that direction. Yeah, much to my prior programmer's dismay at Sell It, I was the original programmer. And I was programming tactically, not strategically, when I started it and before I handed it over to poor Trevor and my other programmers. And it was a mess. The front end, the design of the website was intertwined with the texting as much as it could be. There was no separation, what's called separation of concern. And when I started handwritten, the reason we made an iPhone app is because when you develop an iPhone app first, you have to have an API layer. So the iPhone app is just very pretty and it has to talk to something and it talks to an API layer. That API layer, we then built a website on top of so that we had a good website. And then we built a whole set of other integration. Nowadays, I will say it's much easier because websites now are very different than websites when I built Sell It. 
back then you'd write HTML and PHP and that type of thing. Now it's all in React and Angular and, and everything else. These very robust front-end frameworks that require an API. Back then they didn't. But once you develop this API layer, that allows you to take your service and be everywhere your customer is. The perfect thing for this is Zapier. Zapier is kind of like a poor man's API integration. For those of you guys that don't know what Zapier is, if you have an online service, whether it's your CRM system or your order management system or your whatever, that probably connects to Zapier. Zapier connects to 3,000 plus other things, including handwritten, and therefore your order management system connects to handwritten. You can think of Zapier as, and their logo used to be it until they made the poor decision to get rid of it. It's like the center spoke of a bicycle wheel. You have all the spokes coming out and Zapier sits in the middle and your app comes in, goes to the central hub of Zapier, and then goes out another spoke, which is handwritten. So they, by leveraging our system with that, we are able to quickly build integrations for thousands of platforms. In addition to that integration, we integrate with Salesforce directly, Shopify directly, HubSpot directly, BlackBod, which is a nonprofit management system, systems for car dealerships, et cetera, because we want you to automate handwritten notes. It's not enough to send them. We want you to automate them because even if you make the intention to send handwritten notes, a lot of people aren't as good as you, Tim. They just stop doing it month one, month two. But if you automate it and you turn your service into utility where they don't even think about it, they're just, you know, here's my monthly handwritten bill. I guess they got to pay that. It's A, keeps them doing what they want to do, what they intend to do, and B, it makes us money. So it was always the intention that Handwritten would not be a marketing platform. It would be a customer experience utility. So flashing back to my days at Sell It, I would go into meetings. I had the XCMO of Samsung as one of my salespeople for a while. And we go into these meetings with these highfalutin, highbrow marketing execs. And they'd sit around pontificating endlessly and then never do anything. And if you got them to do something, it was always a one-time task and they'd never do it again. And that's kind of what marketing is. It's these one-time tasks that never do it again. But if you design yourself as a CRM initiative and a utility, change the mindset. We don't need to come up with a razzle-dazzle thing this month and a razzle-dazzle handwritten note next month. And something completely unique and different yeah, the month great. after that. So glad to what be you on need here. to I'm do so is just thank your customers when they make a big purchase. Uh, and I'm looking forward to tuning to, so to see some great content. We just try to create APIs that allow our customers to do that easily without jumping through a lot of hoops. Long answer, short question. I think that this is a great example in my mind. I, I've been sharing a lot. People are going to get tired of hearing me talk about this, but Roger Martin from the Rotman School's great thinker, management writer. Uh, he talks about this idea of the great leaders or people that can hold seemingly opposing ideas in their mind. To me, handwritten is a great example. Most people would think you either have this automated API technology type of thing, or you have to sit there and hurt your hand writing handwritten notes. You have created an formed something that people can do both. They can be both extremely efficient and effective and quick to respond to somebody, but do it in a way that is incredibly personal. Those things seem to be opposing ideas. It seems like technology and efficiency is not personal, but you've made it that way that you can do that. Like I'm able to provide hospitality at scale and Correct. that's the question yeah. that people are always at. How do I provide hospitality at scale? This is an incredible way to be able to do that. Yeah. And this is an, an exact example, but we have a, and you've probably heard this because clearly you've done your background research on me. We have this piano tuner in Pennsylvania and he goes in your house once a year and tunes your piano. That's all your piano needs. He's not going to upsell you an additional tuning. It, it, it's silly. But what he is going to do is he automates sending a handwritten note to you afterward, thanking for the opportunity to tune your piano and be in your house and work on your most prized possession. He told us that he, more often than not now, when he goes into a repeat tuner's home the following year, that handwritten note is 
standing up on the piano, on display. So not only is it open, not only is it red, it's kept like a treasure because the least used mailbox these days is the one at the end of your driveway. Everybody's hitting your cell phone. Nobody's going to print out a text message, sorry, sell it, and stick it to their piano. But people will take a handwritten note and put that on display because they realize at least you're doing something different and you're really trying to stand out. I had this guy try to sell me, I think it was SEO services. And he sent me the FedEx package. So that cost $20 right there. And inside the FedEx package was this like thick cardboard card. And when you'd open up the card, there was a little video screen. And then that video screen started playing some blather corporate speak baloney that I didn't even watch. But what I realized from this experience was he was trying to get my attention, which is fair. He used a very of the moment technology. He didn't think about how else he could do it. And all I could think of when I saw this little thing was how does it work and how much does it cost? How does it work was the main thing. If I received a handwritten note, it would be genuine. I wouldn't think how does that work? And then how much does it cost? If he's sending these packets to all these companies around the United States, he must be making bank on SEO services. I'm a startup. You know, I can't afford for somebody to get rich off my service. So I emailed him back and said, hey, thanks for the thing. I'm going to send it back to you so you can recycle it. But you're sending an impression that I'm going to be a very, very high margin client for you. And you're doing it in a way that would be much more cost effective if you just sent a handwritten note. I think everybody's always looking for the next new thing and they really need to return to the roots. And that root could just be picking up a pen and writing a note. But to your point at scale, as much as you'd want to send all these handwritten notes, who has the time? You want to spend time with your family and your kids. Back in the day before our service, you'd have CEOs of companies have their admins do it. That's the same thing. It's just creating more risk in there in some ways. So Maybe I had too much coffee this morning, but same thoughts about it. I absolutely I love that perspective. And I think that that actually answers maybe some of the objections or concerns that people have. Oftentimes, as I'm sharing that I'm utilizing this tool, people go, well, isn't that impersonal? And I go, no, it's I cared enough to do this. And if I had right. limited time, this is a way for me to maximize my time. It's why I have an assistant that works with me in the mm-hmm. first place and who's helping to draft things up and create systems and processes because I care enough to think about that. It's an act and it certainly is so simple. And it's so interesting that the simplest things are sometimes and most often the most powerful things that happen yeah. for people. Your note to that person is always going to be thoughtful. And it just, it magnifies the impact by putting in a handwritten note. You know, if you were to send them a text message or an email, they would say, oh, okay, that's nice. But by putting those words down, because they are your thoughts, written by a robot, but it's your thoughts, it just magnifies, at least my opinion, it magnifies the impact. I agree. Yeah, just in the age of robots and AI, the need for more human touch and human interaction like this is going to be more and more important. Just, Just certainly my opinion. Well, I'm thrilled. You drank the Kool-Aid on that one. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. Let me ask you a little bit more about company building. So yeah, this time around, I think you have an opportunity where you are are leading probably in a different way than you were at Sell It, or you've certainly learned more over the years. So how is your leadership style or what is your leadership style and how has it evolved over time as you look back over your career? What I will say is when I got And I don't know if you're experiencing this. Not all your employees are as grateful as you would like them to be for what you're doing for them. But anyway, when I sold Sell It, they did an employee satisfaction survey with my employees and the results were not great. They said things, most people really liked me, which was good because a lot of them, I paid a lot of money when I sold the company. Most of them really liked me. There were a few that, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease and there's at least one guy and I know who it was, but he said stuff like, I would be in my office shouting, flipping over my desk. I'm sorry, this was a very large Ikea desk. There'd be no way I could flip that sucker over. But the fact that he'd say that meant that clearly people would hear me pound the desk and it would 
impact them and, and affect them. And it hit me really hard when I was told that I was doing this. I wasn't, but there were truths in it. So that changed my management style at the company that acquired us. I kind of fell into depression for a bit and I really took a pretty far step back, but it was okay because I was handing over the reins to somebody else anyway. And it gave me time to reflect on that. When I started handwritten, it was really important to try to create a culture here that's inclusive, where everybody feels heard. And over the last couple of years, I've really tried to manage my own anger, <laughs> my own anxiety. I, I do have a little bit of an anxiety, maybe a little bit of an anger management thing, but I don't take it out on anybody in the office. If somebody hears me yelling, it's usually at like a veterinarian for pulling out too many dog's teeth without my approval. So I don't know where I heard this thing, but I've taken it to heart. Your face is public property. Treat it that way. And it's not just your face. It's everything. You know, your demeanor impacts people and you have to take that into consideration in any situation you go into. So I just try to remain very level. I meditate. I have been hypnotized several times, quite frequently, actually. I find a hypnotist who I live back in Chicago and he's He's kind of my personal guru and changed my life, but kind of understanding the greater context and taking a step back and not reacting, but thinking things through and then trying to find a good course of action from that. As I'm now in this for nine years and handwritten, there's a little bit of fatigue. So I just simply can't get as amped up over things as I used to. I've just been doing this too long. And there's other stuff on my plate with my kids and wife and everything that also we didn't, that when I was with Sell It, I was a single guy in Chicago. So it's partially just wife. It's partially financial security. Now that I sold the company, I have a little money in the bank. It's not like if handwritten closes tomorrow, I'll feel really bad for the employees and the clients, but I'll be okay. So it's just a little bit of a different viewpoint, but there's a couple things that have really helped my management style. We do EOS around here. EOS, which is Entrepreneur's Operating System, was helpful when we started, I'd say to some degree. But once we implemented 90, and I hate giving 90 any shout outs. 90 is a software plat. There's kind of two or three platforms, one called Bloom Growth, and then we use 90. Honestly, it's a piece of junk platform that I wish I created because it would be a lot simpler thing to create than handwritten and they're pure SaaS model. So God bless them. They're, they're just printing cash. It's a terrible platform, but it works. And because of that, you know, I, I have to give it credit. And what 90 does is 90 keeps us on track between our level 10 meetings every week, which is a terminology in EOS. And that has been very valuable for me because it allows me to know that the metrics are being followed up on. We don't review all metrics every week, but the fact that people are inputting their metrics forces them to look at them on a weekly, which is super valuable. I've been fortunate to create a team of highly competent managers. My head of operations now is a very young, very bright woman. I'm very lucky to have her. My head of engineering is still in college, but he's kind of taken the slow path to college, handwritten, underwriting it. But he's a very, very bright guy and good managerial skills. Both of them have the figure it out chain. So it's taken a long time to kind of right size the organization, but just making sure you have the right people in the right seats has been truly valuable and really implementing. Like before we did 90, we just kept a spreadsheet. We'd have a PowerPoint presentation with the items from last week and we'd kind of shuffle them around. But implementing 90 has really made the situation way, way better. And it gives me a lot more visibility into things. So I don't know if that's what you're asking for, but 90 has been a big change in our organization. We also have a much larger team than we had at Sell It. At a peak, I think I had 25 people here. I have 50. And now I'm the old guy, 46 years old. My average person is probably in their late 20s. So I try to be kind of that fatherly nice guy thing, which is weird because to me, I look out at them and I kind of think they're all colleagues and they think of me as old man wax. So we have these weekly meetings and there's half business in there and there's half gags. We start the meeting and we're talking about this new envelope stuffing machine. I say, okay, I'm going to 
show you a video that the company sent over so you can get an idea of how this can impact the business. And the video was just pure nonsense. And it took them a good three minutes to, to get the joke, but we do it stuff like that all the time. Like I'm introducing them to all the old airplane movies without them even knowing. So I'm just trying to keep it light. Through EOS, we developed our core culture, uh, our core tenets of our culture, which is be the change you seek, meaning figure it out. It is focus on the customer. It is play as a team and then no BS, open company, no BS. And those four tenants, we really stick to and we hire and fire. I fired my head of sales because he didn't have the core culture. So trying to understand your core tenants is really important and just really focusing on the customer. So those are kind of the big things. I also spend a lot of time just meeting with my employees and trying to coach them up, not really tell them what to do. You just coach them, as I think you do. Mm -hmm. To manage somebody, you can't tell them what to do. You have to inspire them to do it. So that's kind of what I do. So maybe a bit more on the personal side and then uh, I want to kind of land the yeah. plane with some of the books and resources that you recommend for aspiring entrepreneurs and yeah and existing entrepreneurs too because I've I've read a number of lists as I did my research of some things that you're a big fan of but before I get to that how do you think through kind of your legacy and sort of that tension between building a company and a brand and all those things but also the family that you're building and creating as well. Like, I mean, everybody's always dealing with that and, and you may not have, nobody seems to have the ultimate answer, but how are you thinking about that and approaching it? You know, I, Tim, I got to say, I'm a little jealous of you having your email say it'll be home at four and you're offline until eight. I, so we moved offices to a much better area of town, but it's also 30 minutes, 35 minutes away from me now. So I lose an hour plus a day just commuting to work and back. And because of that, I miss out on seeing my kids a little bit. I try to get home every night for dinner. That's really important to me. And then if I have to go online after they go to sleep at 7.30 or 8, I will do that. But, you know, I really try to be there. And then on weekends, I attend all the hockey and and all that and try to spend as much time with my kids. My wife is always like, you know, are you going to sell this thing one day? I say, but then what would I do? I'm not just going to sit around at the home all day. So I got to do something. So there is that line on the business side. My legacy is really creating good jobs for people. I truly mean it. At Sell It, there's a young woman named Angie. She started as an account manager with us. Prior to working for us, she was a yoga instructor and she came to Sell It and she became my star employee. And when we sold the company, she hated the new owners and she ended up going to a great brand and she really created this tremendous career for herself. And I also gave her a big check when the company sold and she came in my office crying, saying, you know, this money really matters, but what you've done for me and my career is, is more important. And that's been the best, by far, the best part of the job, by far, Mm -hmm. creating and growing employees and changing what they think they're capable of. And it's just been awesome. It's just been totally awesome. And there's been a couple of my old bookkeeper finance woman left salad after I left the company and she started her own startup that does non-emergency medical transportation. And she's just exploded and she credits working at sell it for that. So there's just been a lot of that. And then now at handwritten sell it had a lot more higher educated workforce, but having handwritten, we also have more day labor type because we have people stuffing envelopes and being able to offer hourly workers a safe, clean, respected work environment where people come to work and they're offered free tickets to basketball or hockey games. And we're like, I think today it's Korean month here with the holidays. So I think we have food trucks coming today and, and offering lunches to keep everybody happy. I think really if people appreciate that. And I don't know about you, but I have people, you know, when they sign, we say, okay, here's the direct deposit form. And they say, well, I don't have a bank account. And I just press them very hard on that. And I say, well, you got to get a bank account. And they said, well, I just don't have one. I said, no, it's free, go get one. I don't want the hassle. The excuse is I don't want the hassle of printing a paper check to them. 
The real reason is to get them into some financial literacy. And we've done this to a number of QA envelope stuffers, and they've then come back and said it's changed their life. One woman, she used to clean toilets in a motel, and now she was our head of QA for a while. And she came and she said, you know, before starting at Handwritten, I was poor. I just bought a new TV last week, and I have money in the bank. I didn't have a bank account, and now I have money in the bank. So like those types of things, it's no BS. That's the mm. part of the job. I love that. All right, so, talking to people like you, they use that. I mean, that's all so awesome. Right, the customers as well. And I think I, I really do. You, you've created a invaluable resource and the way that you've gone about it. I can't say enough about that. I'm so glad it exists and it continues to exist. You guys are far and above the best resource and the ability to connect with other tools and resources, which even in my business, I, I don't necessarily need that, but the ability to be able to do that is really incredible. And I'm hoping and rooting for your continued success because you have the opportunity in the midst of an environment that's growing more and more run by robots. And, and I, I love AI and I'm very excited about that. The need for these human connections is going to be even more important. This human touch is going to be even more important. And to be able to leverage the technology to do that is very, very exciting. So I'm really pleased to really partner and pay you guys as much as I can every single month. So it's great. Well, let me let me ask you this because I want you to be able to go and continue to work and uh, do the great work you're doing there. So I'd love for you to leave with us some books or resources for either aspiring entrepreneurs or existing entrepreneurs. I know that you have mentioned in many places your affinity for the book, The E-Myth, which I think is probably essential reading before you start any kind of business. But are there any other books or resources that you'd recommend to people? Yeah. And I learned about this one by being on a podcast. There's a woman named Brittany Hoda, who you should connect with. She has a book called Creating Superfans. And I found speaking with her, I was speaking with you to be just tremendously insightful. I read her book. Because of that, we're starting to practice what we preach. So and I don't know if you missed this or not, but when they now, for the last couple months, when you sign up for Handwritten and you buy a certain prepaid package or a subscription, we now send you a whole swag pack with, you know, a handwritten note for me. Did you get that? I did. It was awesome. Okay. All right. I want to make sure you got that. If not, I'll send you one now. But, you know, we're trying to, and it's strictly to, to get back what people want from us. They want to be able to send out handwritten notes. We want to be able to send them a handwritten note and gift and that type of thing. So Brittany Hodak and Creating Superfans, it really is a good read. You know, all these business books, after you read it, you say, well, that was obvious. Well, if it was so obvious, why aren't you doing it? So that's been a really valuable read. And then Traction, the book about EOS, is a very good read, but it's much more than a read. You have to change your whole business management framework. And these days, a lot of people are. So I would say Traction it's another really, really important. Oh, uh, that's great. Okay. So what call to action you have? Where can folks find more about you and more about handwritten? Handwritten is easy. Just go to H A N D W R Y T T E N dot com and you can actually request free samples if you click business at the top. If you want to learn more about me, just go on LinkedIn and search David Handwritten and I should pop up. And uh yeah, that's kind of it. We do monthly webinars usually, so feel free to tune into some of those. I might ask you to be on one, Kim. We're kind of switching the focus. That's a good way to learn about everything we do too. I love it. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Kim. It's it a true pleasure. Oh, man, a great word. Hey, folks, thanks so much for listening to the Tension Podcast. It would be fantastic if you would take just a couple of moments to leave a review or rate us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. It really does help the show. Thanks so much for listening. To find out more about the Tension Podcast, visit www.tensionpod.com or you can find me on Twitter at Tim Sweetman. <laughs>